Hello, this is Angela with Parker's Permaculture. I'm sitting in the backyard of my Portland, Oregon permaculture garden. I have one quarter acre here in zone 8B and you can hear there's a hawk in the background. Um, love hearing wildlife around the perimeter of my garden. So I normally talk about uh, sustainable food production and uh, permaculture as a design system. And today I wanna go a little bit, uh, stray a little bit away from my standard fare. I thought I would talk about a recent project that I undertook. Now, a lot of permaculture focuses on resilient living and using strategies to build a more uh, a regenerative way of being. And part of that is building skills for resilience. And I know for me, I'm always trying to acquire new skills even though I've been doing permaculture for 20 years, even though I have been a professional homemaker for more than 20 years, I never stop having a desire to acquire new skills that I think can not only enrich my quality of life, but also can make me a more resilient person. And when I was younger, I dabbled a little bit in woodworking and my dad has been a pretty serious woodworker. And I kind of gave it up in the course of pursuing growing living things more than uh, more indoor hobbies. Now that my dad lives one block away and he's disabled and visually impaired, we spend a little bit of time, I try to almost every single day, working with him in his, his wood shop. He's not able to uh, undertake all of these skills and activities that he used to be able to by himself. And so the fact that I can be there and we can do those things together means that he's teaching and imparting important skills to me. And it also means that he is able to uh, still engage with the hobby that he loved so much and meant so much to him for more than 50 years. So the project that we recently completed together was a utility knife. Now in permaculture, I use a knife a lot. It's probably my number one tool. Uh, it's either a tie between uh, hand pruners and um, my, uh, favorite hatchet or a utility knife. And by utility knife, I mean I use my flex cut a lot and I really needed something with a little bit bigger blade. And so this is more of a hunting knife type knife. And I find it extremely useful to have in the garden. So I wanted to make one for myself. Now my dad bought a uh, knife kit from Rockler ages and ages ago and he wasn't able to complete uh, those kinds of projects anymore. So I thought, well, I'll make it. And before folks tell me that the wood I'm using in this project is not sustainable, I know that Purple Heart is a uh, South American hardwood that is not often sustainably harvested, but my dad bought the wood for this probably 20 years ago, and it's just been sitting around. So sometimes when we use an imperfect resource, it's better to use something that's already been created, already been uh, removed from nature or manufactured, rather than to purchase a sustainable alternative. The more sustainable alternative is to actually use what you have, even if it meant that, um, buying it new or harvesting it new now would not be more sustainable. If you already own it, you should use it rather than purchase an alternative. So today's video, I'm just gonna walk you through how I made my knife. I have some footage and some stills and talk about the ins and outs of this project. And then I'll meet you back at the end and we can talk a little bit more about permaculture and scale building. This kit was purchased several years ago from Rockler, although they do still carry it in stock. I would not recommend it if you are a beginning woodworker without the necessary tools and skills. It is not a novice project, but it's not super difficult either. Here are the Purple Heart scales I started with, which were purchased separately. The first step in any woodworking project where you are making a knife is to tape the blade. I used two layers of blue painter's tape to protect not only the tip of the knife, but also the cutting edge from chips and scratches, and also to protect my hands as the knife comes pre-sharpened. It is very sharp. The first real step in the project after taping the blade is to trace out the outline of the tang and mark where the pinholes will be going. Next, I needed to get ready to drill the holes into the Purple Heart wood scales. I needed two C-clamps for this, as well as my drill press. I also used a backer board to avoid blowouts on the back side of the scale. It's really important to make sure your scale lies flush and that you don't need to plane the back side of it. Mine was very flat and I knew I would have good contact with the tang. Quick note here because I forgot to mention earlier, I'm using this white pastel pencil because it really shows up far better on the dark wood than a regular pencil. 
I used the pencil and made sure that when I traced the outline, it was nice and clear. Again, I got this pastel pencil at Michael's Craft Store. I think it was 79 or 89 cents. Here you can see my dad and I clamping the tang to the scale to the backer board. This was a little bit of a fidgety operation and I was glad to have a second pair of hands. I made sure to clamp in between the drill holes, getting nice even pressure and making sure that I wasn't gonna get any slippage whatsoever when I went to work on the drill press. I'll also note here that another advantage of having a backer board is that the C-clamps don't leave any indentations on my scale itself as they are putting pressure on the backer board and not the very expensive exotic wood that I'm using. Also, make sure that when you are attaching your C-clamps, you have room for your drill press to function in between. That's super important. I ended up using a 5 8 inch drill bit. Now you'll notice here I'm using my dad's 40 plus year old shopsmith. I really enjoyed using it for this project. It's a great multi-use tool. However, I wish it was about three inches taller as I am six feet tall and it's a little bit short. I found my back hurting at the end of each working session. To make room for my C-clamps, I simply propped up my working piece on some scraps of oak. It worked very well. I'm very familiar with the drill press, having recently used it for a very complicated project. The key is just to work slow and make sure you are lined up well. I really enjoy using it and found it made quick work of drilling the holes in both scales. After successfully drilling the holes in both scales, the next step was to remove the clamps and the tang and start sawing out the rough shape. I used a Japanese pole saw, which I highly recommend, and then for the curved edges, I switched to a coping saw. Now, obviously you could do this on the bandsaw, but I really enjoy working by hand, and I'm only roughing it out here to get to a point where I can sand. A quick note, if you are not familiar with using this kind of saw, it works on the pull and not on the push. I love the fact that my entire childhood my dad drilled into me. You let the saw do the work with its own weight. You don't push, you just facilitate the saw moving under its own weight. That way you don't get any snags and you cut as crisply and quickly as possible. Just let the weight of the saw do the work. I cannot reiterate that enough times. After knocking off all the straight edges, I switched to a coping saw to get those curves. I have extensive experience making silver jewelry. It is a hobby my dad and I enjoyed together through all of my childhood, and so I'm very comfortable using a coping saw and find it's a tool I really enjoy using. After a while, I got frustrated with my Stanley clamp slipping and I tried a variety of setups until I finally settled on familiar territory using what I'm comfortable with, which is a jeweler's bench clamp. I had great success using my coping saw and getting those curves roughed out. Again, here, all we are striving for is roughing out the shape. We are doing the fine tuning with a drum sander, which is coming up. Next, I took down my drill press and I set up my drum sander. Using a shopsmith takes a little bit of strategizing as you have to stage all of the work as you swap in and out the various components of this multi-use tool. The dust of purple heartwood is really, really not good to inhale, so it's important to wear a respirator when working with this and other exotic woods. I also had a room air filtration system and a shop vac vacuum hooked up to my drum sander. Here I am sanding down only the front edge of the scales where they 
uh, reach the front of the knife edge. That's because once I glue these scales to the wood, these have to be finished. The process of sanding them once they're attached to the knife can cause damage to the knife. So you must get them to a finished stage, including hand sanding, before you attach them to the knife blade itself. You can also see that I have both sections of the scales C-clamped together, and that's to make sure that I have nice symmetry as I sand down those front edges of the scales. I really love using a drum sander between the white noise of the machinery and the filtration system, and the work itself, it's a really meditative process. Here you can see the leading edge of the knife, which has been taken down all the way to 600 grit sandpaper. I love the gorgeous patterning in this purple heart. The next part of the process is pretty darn fiddly. It's where you attach the two scales to the tang itself and you use epoxy and a series of three pins. I actually had to file all three of these pins by hand to make them fit through the holes because my drill press is not metric, but the pins are. My dad wanted to take charge of the epoxy. We used a five minute epoxy in which you apply two equal ribbons of each of the two ingredients and mix thoroughly and then have five minutes to act. It was a little bit of a stressful situation. My dad took the epoxy and applied it to the scales. We added the tang and then added the other side of the scales. And then I proceeded to hammer the pins through all three layers. Now he ended up using probably about four times as much epoxy as we needed and it oozed out everywhere after clamping. I would recommend using a judicious amount of epoxy, but don't worry if you have ooze out, it will sand off later. After the epoxy had a chance to cure overnight. I then took a saw and cut off the excess portion of the pins, leaving it flush with the surface of the knife. And then it was back to the drum sander. I needed to use two different diameters because there was a front little finger crook in the knife that required a narrow diameter to get it all nice and smoothed out. I set the height of the drum sander to just barely below the surface level of the table. Now I also used a backer board here because I wasn't smoothing out the flat edges of the knife and I had some rough raised spots from my pin sawing that meant that my knife kept catching on the table and it was much easier to put the knife on an elevated surface so it wouldn't catch on the table and I could get a nice even sanding to the inside surfaces of my knife. Here you can see my shop vac hookup, keeping the dust to a minimum. Again, I'm wearing a respirator through this entire process. I want to prioritize safety and the health of my lungs while I enjoy my hobby. particularly when you are sanding off epoxy, but in any woodworking, you end up getting an accumulation of material on the sander, which makes it difficult for it to work efficiently. Using a piece of crepe rubber can help clean it off very quickly. I found it very effective, especially in removing all the gummy epoxy I was sanding. So here is the result of drum sanding. I have finished the inside and back edge of the knife. They are all smoothed down and I am ready to get out the belt sander and take on the final shaping of the knife. My 
my dad may be visually impaired, but he is an expert woodworker and he can work by touch as much as anything and can still use a belt sander. He enjoyed helping me with this portion of the project, helping get a nice curve to the edge of the knife. Using the drum sander and belt sander, we have now roughed out the final shape and are switching to hand sanding with various levels of sandpaper working all the way up to 1000. I'll also add here that I coated the knife in acetone and set it out in the sunshine. This helps the brownish color of the freshly revealed wood turn a bright purple. It's really important when you work in Purple Heart that you put it out in the sunshine, flipping it over every half hour for the course of several hours. In the and what you're left with is a gorgeous purple color you would not see otherwise. The acetone helps it oxidize more quickly and reach its full vibrant hue as quickly as possible. Now many folks polyurethane their purple heart to preserve the color and I wanted a natural non-plastic finish so I decided to go with wet sanding using 500 and then 1000 grit sandpaper and Danish oil. For many of my woodworking projects, I used tongue oil, but I found it would have darkened this wood too much after testing it on some samples, and a woodworking board suggested using natural color Danish oil. Here you can see my final coat after I have finished wet sanding. Now it's important to do the wet sanding first because that helps incorporate all of the little dustings, all of the little bits that come off in the sanding into the matrix of the oil and the wood itself. It makes for a super soft, supple, fine polish at the end. A really, really nice natural finish. I ultimately applied two finished coats of Danish oil, waiting for it to be soaked up into the wood and then buffing off the excess. With my knife finished, I had one step left in this project, and that was to take the extremely ill-fitting leather holster that came with the kit and make it fit my knife. I soaked the leather thoroughly and added a block of wood and four chopsticks to approximate the shape of my finished knife. I started with a holster that was loose and poorly fitting. My knife barely stayed in it and I was worried it would fall out. And what I ended up with at the end was a snugly fitting holster where the first finger grip went all the way inside and it took just a little tug for me to get the knife out, but it fit really nicely and it feels very secure. While there are some imperfections and some things I would change if I had to do it over again, I'm very, very pleased with this knife and I use it regularly in the garden. I'm also really thrilled at all of the skills I learned and honed in the process of making this project. I feel like a much more capable woodworker and can use a wider array of tools than I had previously been accustomed to. Thank you for watching. I know this is a little bit different than my typical video. I hope that uh, you got something out of it. I just want to reiterate that in permaculture, we can have a focus on building skills, acquiring a library, a cohort of skills that can help carry us toward a more resilient way of living. Not only when we 
take the time to become autodidacts, where we take the time to be a kind of person who can teach themselves new skills. Or if we're not that kind of a person, where we can uh, make connections with family or community members, with neighbors, with experts on the internet that help us gain skills. So I just want to emphasize that in permaculture, um, don't lose sight of the fact that hobbies are important, that skill building not only helps us um, keep our brains elastic, malleable, open to learning new ideas, open to learning new skills that can help us be more sustainable people, more resilient people, but it also improves our quality of life. And overall, it helps us um, acquire a large skill set that we can use in our permaculture, on our homesteads, in our gardens, and we can also share with the community to build stronger community connections. So I hope that you take the time to create new hobbies, create new space in your life to find new hobbies, to build new skills. Even if all you're doing is taking on a small, simple project like mine, where I decided, hey, I'm going to um, make my knife and I know it is a practical tool I'll use, but in the process of making it, I have to learn new skills. I have to use machinery I've never used before. I have to uh, learn techniques that I've never uh, implemented before. And that not only is something that is engaging and interesting for me, but it's something that um, helps me build those skills that maybe I can use in future situations. It makes me kind of a, a jack of all trades and a master of none, but that's okay. I think that's a lot of what permaculture is about and I can help share those skills with others and I can help enjoy them and use them to build my quality of life as well. So don't discount the uh, benefit to you as a person. Don't discount the um, multiple layers of stacking functions that we get when we take on the task of building skills in permaculture. It enriches our life, it makes us more resilient people, and it helps us have a skill set that we can share to build more resilient communities. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please click subscribe and share with your friends. 